The first reading today is from Matthew chapter 16, and starting at verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it, will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come and, uh, in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. I tell you the truth. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning at verse 8. Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You have become kings, and that without us. How I wish you really had become kings, that we might be kings with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like men condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to men. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honoured, we are dishonoured. To this very hour we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags, we are brutally threatened, we are homeless. We work hard with our hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer up kindly. Up to this moment, we have become the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. I'm not writing this to shame you, but to warn you. As my dear children, even though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word to us. It's a light for our path. It is food for our soul. May it be so for us this morning. Amen. Well, just before Easter, um, I gave a bit of a presentation about the possibilities that lie ahead of us uh, when it comes to looking at uh, the shape and form of leadership uh, in this parish and what might be the possibilities over uh, the next few, uh, over, for what lies ahead. And uh, as Tina mentioned, um, that conversation continues today. And if after we've finished here, uh, if we've after we've finished here, if you want to know more about focal ministry, or if you have any questions about it, then grab a cup of tea, grab a cup of coffee, and then come back in, and we'll continue the conversation. Um, but whatever the future holds, um, it will involve a sense in which, together as a church we discern not only the form of leadership that we will implement in this church, but it will also have some sense of putting our hearts and our minds and our prayers towards discerning who might we call from amongst ourselves to exercise leadership in our midst. And so we're going to talk a little bit about leadership today. Now for some, uh, 
the sense of discerning who we might call together might seem a little strange, particularly if you are an Anglican in the Church of England. We are very used to having our leaders chosen for us. We are used to our leaders being chosen by a bishop or by a small committee of various people from the deanery, whatever that is, or by having a restructure of a benefice done by the authority of the diocesan ministry and pastoral committee. And even our bishops are chosen by a mix of a crown nominations committee, the prime minister and the king himself. You've got to be excited about that. It can all seem a bit up there. Uh, Even at the local level, when we want to choose and raise up leaders, we often delegate it. We get the vicar to appoint his or her deputies, or we ask a subcommittee of PCC to sort it out. And none of that is bad. We all need some processes that have checks and balances and, and all that sort of thing. But I do find myself contrasting that way of discerning leadership with the way of the early church. In the book of Acts, there is leadership. There's clearly some senior leaders. There are the the apostles who are appointed by Jesus himself at the beginning. But they also did, and they also did some appointing. They appointed elders often in the places where they went. But they didn't exercise their leadership in some sort of dominion way. In fact, in Acts chapter 6, there's a clear sense in which how they operated. When it became clear that the church in the book of Acts in chapter 6 in Jerusalem, and needed deacons to exercise leadership, what the apostles did was they gathered all the disciples, that is, they gathered the whole church, and they said to them, choose from amongst yourselves seven people who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. In other words, you choose, you decide who the deacons are going to be, who is going to lead us in this way. And in Acts chapter 13, the church in Antioch, where Christians were first called Christians, the whole church was gathered in a posture of worship and prayer and fasting, and collectively they heard the Holy Spirit say to them, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And so Barnabas and Saul weren't even appointed by the apostles. They had to go down and introduce themselves to the apostles. They were commissioned to missional leadership by the church gathered from a posture of prayerfulness and worship. So you see, that's the sort of thing that happened in the early church. And part of me is excited about the possibility for us exercising something similar as we move forward. And that's why over these next few weeks as we Uh, ahead of our annual meeting on May the 14th, I thought it would be a good idea to reach down and uncover some more of the biblical foundations of leadership as we see in the Bible. If we are to discern together how the Spirit might be speaking to us about the leadership in this church, then it's a good idea to go, well, how did the Spirit speak in the world of the Bible? After all, it's the same spirit in today. And of course, one of the reasons we go to God's word for this is the same reason we go to God's word for anything, to be equipped, to be guided, to be shaped, to be corrected. And particularly when it comes to leadership, leadership in general, and church leadership in particular, we do need the word of God to be deconstructing what we might have made leadership to be, so that it could be the most life-giving thing possible. That's the task for today and for what we're going to be looking at in our talks over the next few weeks. Allowing the Word of God to reconstruct what we might think when we think of leadership. You see, when I use the word leader or leadership, I can already tell that it generates an emotional response in us. It certainly does not me. And there are two broad responses that I find as soon as we encounter the L word. A common response when it comes to leadership is hurt and pain. Many of us 
carry wounds from our experience of those who have called themselves leaders, particularly in the church. And why is that? Leadership, whether we like it or not, is about the exercise of a certain degree of power. It may not be control, although it can be, particularly when it's toxic, but it certainly is the capacity and the ability to shape and influence. All of us, to a greater or lesser extent, lead to some degree. As parents, we lead our children, we influence them. If we don't, we're not doing our job. Spouses often lead each other, and in any given conversation in our ordinary fellowship, there will always be a degree of listening, but also a desire, a good desire, for us to speak something into that dialogue, to guide and shape the direction of the conversation. That's a good thing. That's a form of leadership. We're seeking to influence for the good. If we have an area of expertise or experience or a particular perspective that's valuable, then the effect of what we speak is amplified. We have a greater level of influence and one might argue a greater level of responsibility. And there are other factors at play as well. We have various privileges. Some personalities are more clearly influential than others. Our sense of confidence or our right to speak all affect this sense of influence and the ability to change things. And none of that is bad. We are all influencers and not just in the Instagram sense. We affect who and what is around us. That's the image of God in us to be relational. As followers of Christ, as disciples of Jesus, our calling isn't to give away their influence and pretend it's not there. It's to ensure that what we do with that is filled with life and goodness and brings all that is good rather than used to tear down or destroy. We are all leaders and we must make sure that our leadership is loving and building up and postured in humility and so on. It's one of the reasons I push back at, at the sometimes I hear it in, in the church world at a form of absolutist egalitarianism. I hear it occasionally. It, comes, it sounds like this. Someone says, we don't need leaders' will. None of us need to lead. We don't buy into power dynamics. Ironically, the person who says that, by saying it, is leading. Right? It's simply not a reality. Even if the only person you are influencing is yourself, you are at least leading yourself, your own internal world and your posture with God. We all lead to some degree, and if we, and if we pretend that we don't, then we are unable to examine ourselves, humble ourselves, and ensure that we are leading well. And if we understand that that dynamic is, we can also understand why leadership, especially church leadership, can often be a painful experience. Because when we have off, uh, offer people a, a leadership within our community, we are offering them a place, a position, and we are taking the risk by giving them permission to influence us. We are saying, influence us. We say, give us direction, give us advice, give us insight. Draw, you are the one that we are asking to draw our collective decisions together, to adjudicate when there are differences. We want you to set an example, show us a way. We want you to demarcate our priorities. We want your influence in our community. We're giving them permission to affect our lives. And we're handing them the tools to do it. And like any tool, a tool could be used to bring life and to build up, or it could be used to bring pain and wounding. Leadership exercised by humans is always imperfect, but it can also be negligent and abusive. And many of us have the scars and the wounds to show that. Which means the thought of asking someone to lead us, to discern from amongst our number 
who might we say be a leader amongst us, is an understandably big ask as we contemplate what that might mean. And even more, to contemplate the possibility of you perhaps being a leader in our church can be a terrifying thought. Why would you give me that power? I don't want to hurt anyone. Does that make sense? Please hear me when I say that I share some of these emotions. Apart from my many failings, I know that simply by wearing this collar and being the person that stands at the front of this church reasonably frequently, I can inhabit a position which others have been hurt by. And I know when people have looked at me and not seen me, they've seen through me the church leader that has hurt them in the past. I know when that happens. And all I can say is I'm sorry that church leaders have hurt you. And I too hope those moments. There are certain church leaders who by their position and persona when they speak trigger every alarm bell in me and the fight and flight kicks in. But what I long for isn't that their leadership would disappear. I long for for their leadership to be done well. I don't look up the chain to bishops and archbishops and things and say, go away, I don't need you. I look up the chain and say, cover me well. Help me. Lead me. Do it well. Do it like Jesus. So that's the first response we often have to the L word. And I wonder what the word of God can do to help us to respond to that. And there's a second reaction we often have to the L word, to leadership. And I find that that reaction comes in the form of caricature. When I say the word leader, then I suspect that what what we often have is an image that jumps into our mind of what we think a leader looks like. Perhaps we imagine someone wearing a politician suit with crazy blonde hair, or we think of a powerful business person with rockets that explode. In church circles, we might think of someone who has a stage to command, many followers on Instagram and a successful podcast. Perhaps it's someone who has a name, who has been successful in some way, someone with an entrepreneurial, go-get-it-done attitude that achieves something. Whatever it is, we often attach the word leadership to a caricature that buys into some sort of success. And I get it. In one of my previous jobs, I happened to qualify for attendance at the New Leaders of Larger Anglican Churches Conference. I thought it might have been the New Larger Leaders of Anglican Churches, but that's not what they meant. And uh, I went to this conference, they had some good stuff in it, but it actually, what it felt like was someone was coming up to me and putting their arm around my shoulder and saying, oh, well, well done, son, you've made it to the big time now. The thing is, of course, if we think that leadership is like that, we'll do two things. First of all, when we look for leaders in our midst, we'll look for people who fit the bill, who meet that caricature. It'll be like when they were looking at King Saul back in the Old Testament and they noticed that he was taller than everybody else. They go, oh, he's kingly, that guy. And it went terribly wrong. And secondly... If we buy into that caricature, we'll disqualify ourselves from leadership because we go, oh, there's no way I can be like that. That's for other people. So we have these two reactions. Understandable hurt and pain. Understandable buying into a caricature. And what the Word of God does, particularly in our Bible passage today, is it cuts across all that. Clearly there are big names in the Bible And there are moments of success, and some of them, including Jesus, are famous. But the ones who truly capture the heart of God for leadership do it differently to the world. And so if we take our reading from 1 Corinthians that we had today, Paul is speaking to his church, the church he planted. And he's clearly a leader. 
At the end of his exhortation, he's saying, imitate me. That's, <laughs> that's a bold thing to say, isn't it? But what does he mean by that? How does he do that? As Paul starts in this reading, uh, you've got to realize that the Corinthian church that he founded and then left to go live in Ephesus, um, well, they've grown and they've become a big name church. They would be the church with the nicely branded website. I can tell you that. And they're able to afford the big name speakers, the super apostles, literally called super apostles, who would come and give them a stirring speech and tickle their ears. They've outgrown their founder. And Paul leans into this situation because he looks at them and goes, well, you're not actually healthy. That's what most of 1 Corinthians is about. And uh, he leans into this bigness that they have with a degree of sarcasm, pastoral sarcasm. And he says, already you've won. You have all you want. You've become rich. You have begun to reign. And you've done all that without us. How I wish that you really had, because then I could join in. I could reign with you. And he uses this image of the emperor, a triumphant emperor, returning from the war. Such an emperor would come into the city, probably Rome, and would have a parade, which was literally called a triumph. And at the front of the procession would be the leaders, the emperor himself and his generals and, and then all the troops. And then there would be the loot, the gold and the other plunder that they would scatter to the masses. And right at the end, there would be the prisoners of war and the other, others who would be brought back, maybe to be fed to the lions or if they were lucky, to be formed into gladiators. And Paul spins this image. He says, I'm glad you are leaders, like at the front of the procession. But it seems to me, he says, that God has put us apostles on display at the other end. Like those condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe to angels as well as to human beings. We are fools for Christ, but you're so wise. We are weak, but you're so strong. You are honoured, we are dishonoured. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags, we are brutally treated, we are homeless, we work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly, we have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world. Poetic language. My friends, when Paul speaks of his own leadership as an apostle, he does not lean into his success or his skills or his shining charisma. He doesn't lay claim to numbers. He leans into his weakness to lead according to the way of Christ, Paul has learned, isn't to ride a war horse, it's to follow the one who rode a donkey. It isn't to lay claim to the rights of victory, it's to do what Christ urged his friends to do. Pick up your cross, your instrument of execution, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life and have a big name will lose it but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Blessed when you are cursed, endure when you are persecuted. And Paul at other times would speak of his leadership using the phrase, sharing in the sufferings of Christ. Not because he thought he was joining Jesus on his cross, like some sort of messiah, but because he had learned that the way of leadership was the way in which you would yearn for and pray for and travail for the people of God like a parent yearns for their children. Not to control them, but to lift them up. And that's why he says at the end, you have had 10,000 guardians, but you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I am your father in the gospel. That's what he means when he says, imitate me. His qualification for his leadership is not his success, but simply in his presence, 
is giving of himself to the burdens and cares of the people. It's in his God-reliant posture that the life-giving influence comes. I think Paul knows at this point what the words of Christ mean when Christ says, take my yoke upon you because my yoke is easy and my burden is light because it's the yoke of grace. It's the yoke of willing to be scum and garbage in order to speak life. And I tell you what, I'd rather have that yoke of leadership any day than the burden that comes from having to strive, strive, strive like some megalomaniac trying to force growth into their church. Can I tell you, sometimes in my job, I have to assess someone for leadership, including self-assessment, just to add. And long ago, I realised that I had stopped looking for achievements or particular talents or skill sets. Rather, I learned to ask this question. Do I see someone who has picked up their cross? Do I see someone who has learned to die to themselves? I don't look for perfection, but I look for a heart in which I can see that possibility. You see, the more we are like the people at the front of the procession, the more we get the glory, the more we are enamoured by the big personality, the more open we are to the toxicity that can hurt others. The more someone looks like that sort of leader, the less I trust them these days. If I'm that leader, then whatever I can do will max out at the size of me and I'm not that big or healthy. But the more they look like Jesus, the more I see a willingness to be obscure, to respond to curse with blessing, to fear with faith, to being willing to explore their own pain and weakness so that the grace of God might be manifest. When they approach the church, not as a task to be achieved, but as a family, even a broken family that needs to be held and dreamed about and hoped for with a hope that is beyond understanding. The more they look like Jesus, the more I can trust them because I know I can trust Jesus. My friends, we are entering into a season of discernment and this is what I'm asking us to be thinking about. I don't want a toxic church. I don't want us to be a self-successful one. Don't be looking around at others or at yourself by measuring it all by some sense of success or achievement. Rather, be looking for the heart of Christ. Some of us have been led by the Spirit, often through difficult and dry times, or sometimes just through the ordinary path of life. That's often the ground which captures the heart of Christ. Those ones may not look like typical leaders, but you can see something in them that's worth calling out. I would love to call those people together and entrust them with some task of influencing us as a church and as a people. Calling us to a posture of worship and grace, knowing the heart of Christ. As we go into these next few weeks, can you be praying for that? To discern who those, those people might be. And perhaps, in the grace of God, perhaps one of those persons is you. You may not think you look like a leader, but I know all of us have the heart of Christ. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to play a song. It's not a particularly... Um, jump up and down and clap your hands song. It's a song for reflection, so perhaps it can be a prayer for us this morning. And so, Lord, we pray. You are the chief leader of this church. You are the one who guides your people. And we pray the same spirit that took you to the cross (coughs) may be the same spirit that leads us into leading ourselves under your spirit according to your way. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.